Bonjour, euh, messieurs les ministres, euh, monsieur Desmarais, Marc, Vini, re-bienvenue à Montréal. On m'a confié le très agréable mandat de mettre en contexte la conférence d'aujourd'hui. J'en suis bien heureuse et je remercie l'équipe de la conférence de Montréal pour cette invitation. On m'a également mentionné que ce n'était euh, pas nécessaire de présenter Marc, que tout le monde le connaissait et qu'on était tous très fiers et contents d'avoir un banquier, un économiste, quelqu'un qui a été gouverneur de, de banque de deux grands pays du G7, porter un message aussi important et d'une façon aussi habile. La crise climatique actuelle, combinée à l'instabilité économique grandissante, sont des défis historiques que nous devrons relever de façon solidaire. Si nous voulons léguer aux générations futures un modèle plus juste où elles y trouvent leur compte. Nous devons tous apprendre à faire notre métier avec une vision sur le long terme qui donne une place aussi importante au rendement financier qu'au rendement sociétal. Mark Carney a présenté dans son livre « Values, Building a Better World for All » le fruit de plusieurs années de réflexion. Il établit un lien entre les trois principales crises de notre époque, les changements climatiques, l'inégalité croissante, l'impact sur la main d'œuvre de l'essor de la technologie. Mark, you advocate in your book for a shift from prioritizing market value towards an integrated capitalist model that incorporates purpose-driven social values. I'm a strong believer in your proposition. I'm a strong believer that this is not only the responsibility of our governments, but also that of businesses, financial sector, and citizens slash workers. Everybody must contribute if we want to make that shift and solve these issues in a sustainable way. It is probably easier for me to agree because the institution I have the privilege to lead, the Fonds de Solidarité FTQ, pools workers' saving and aims to represent part of workers' contribution to solve these social issues. Our Constituting Act requires us to deliver more than a financial return. We are required to deliver also a social return, to give value to values. We are required to put people at the center of our decisions and that since 1983. The pandemic has forced many to take a step back and realize the importance to rebalance value in markets and values in our society. The challenge now lies in the transition. I am concerned about how to ensure that this transition is made in a fair and just manner for workers. As many of them, this will be a very hard transition. I'm concerned about how to ensure this transition is made in a fair and just manner for small and medium-sized businesses especially in the current economic context where many have a challenged balance sheet and little manpower. The global economy is readjusting to the many changes of the last few years, but is still focused on the short term. It seems that social values are still left out, maybe because they are more complex to consider in the equation. I'm therefore very interested in listening to the conversation between Mark and Vini Chandal, on the general topics of what's next for the global economy and sub subtopics such as inflation, capital market polarization, net zero commitment, sustainability, the future of globalization, and a special request as hydroelectricity. Le, le succès d'une entreprise est étroitement lié au succès de la société dans laquelle elle est implantée. Notre rôle comme dirigeant d'entreprise et d'accentuer les maillages, la collaboration, les partenariats entre nos organisations pour miser sur les forces de chacun et faire avancer notre modèle économique pour qu'il soit plus juste et plus durable pour tous. Je suis convaincue que les prochaines minutes nous feront tous avancer dans cette réflexion. Merci et bonne conférence. Merci, euh, merci Jani. On va faire de notre mieux d'adresser tous ces sujets dans une trentaine de minutes avec <rire> M. Carney. Oui. Euh, Marc, euh, merci d'être parmi nous. Euh, nous sommes très, très heureux de pouvoir euh, échanger avec vous. Look, we have a lot of ground to cover. Jani gave us a, a preview. Um, but look, I, I got to call out uh, the obvious. I'd be remiss if I didn't. You're among, uh, you're, you're doing this in your home country. 
and uh, everybody here is yep. is rooting for you. So in addition to your perspectives on the topics, uh, we also got to get to know the real Mark Carney. And so if you'll permit me, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on the serious, but we'll also have fun. So does that, is that good? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Well, we'll see how you react. Let's, okay. uh, let's get into global economy because uh, yeah. I'd be remiss in not, in not start, starting there. I do want a uh, public service announcement. Yeah. Uh, memos from Mark. It's on the uh, Brookfield website. Uh, you launched your first one uh, recently. It's brilliant, where you really drive home the linkage between macro and climate. Um, so let's get into it. Two supply shocks in two years, uh, COVID, uh, Russia. Uh, uh, COVID is endemic and impacting supply chains. Russia, uh, we see the impact on uh, commodities, energy, uh, food. Um, so, uh, you know, my corporate clients are reacting by uh, optimizing for resilience over efficiency, uh, often proxied through localization of supply chain. That's just a preview of the issues, Mark. In your words, um, unpack this for us. Uh, you know, in general, Petraeus's words, uh, where does this, where does this all end, or how does this all end? Yeah. Uh, okay. Great question, which could take up the 30 <laughs> minutes. Um, uh, but let me let me say at the start, what a what a thrill it is to be back at the Conference de Montréal, and uh, a lot of what uh, Jeannie was saying, and a lot of I think which we'll touch on. Uh, I have to say, from my my perspective, inspired by many of the conversations uh, that we've had at this event, and Helen and Paul, I salute and Jill, uh, your leadership in bringing us all together over the years uh, and, and really helping to form uh, not just a, a set of view around values, but, but around action to put them in place. Now, what's the context uh, we're operating in? And I, I'm going to pick up on a couple of words you said, because I think we are at a hinge moment in history, certainly in economic and geopolitical history. You know, if, you, if I look back, and I've done a few times on my, uh, recently on my entire professional life, uh, I began uh, uh, you know, post university, a year before, six months before uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. So I was worked in a variety of roles around the world uh, for a steady period where. Uh, economic integration, convergence of uh, economic approaches, efficiencies were developed, and there were great rewards. Uh, there were issues with it, but there were great rewards to literally billions of people around the world. That has changed. Um, and what is being prioritized, and it began before Russia's horrific uh, invasion, uh, an unjust invasion of Ukraine began before that, but it has been reinforced by it. Um, and what is happening is that countries and companies are prioritizing resilience over efficiency. There's a rebalancing there. You see it for countries in terms of greater defense spending, greater health spending, spending on health capacity. You see it for companies. Uh, it started with uh, some of the lessons of uh, you know, the, the dangers of pure just-in-time versus just-in-case uh, supply chain. Francois Philippe, uh, the minister, uh, knows this well, and, and, and moving to greater diversification of supply chains for risk management purposes, mm -hmm. and then absolutely reinforced um, by the, uh, let's, let's call a spade a spade, the weaponization of economic integration uh, that has happened. So everything from trade, technology, capital, data, um, is both a good in terms of integration and efficiency, but can be turned into a weapon and in some cases, and necessary case, has been turned into a weapon. So in that environment, uh, companies also engaged, and it's the early stages of this, it's an awkward way of saying it, but geostrategic onshoring. So you're, you, uh, Janet Yellen would call it friendshoring, we might call it nearshoring, but it is a shift in value chains to reliable, jurisdictions, uh, countries with whom you are aligned in terms of most of your underlying values. Maybe not all of the values, but most of your values. That is an enormous shift. Uh, the good news, and I'll hand back to you, uh, and it's a big shift which brings cost to the global economy during this transition. Uh, it is a big shift that brings potentially massive investment near to home, if not at home, and ici au Quebec, surtout. And it is uh, a huge opportunity for Quebec and Canada uh, in that environment, in part because we have the existing, you know, we have as good a trading uh, set of relationships between CETA, uh, USMCA, uh, and uh, TPP, and beyond. And the question is how, in this new environment, all of those are friends. Yeah. Right. In the broader economic sense, in the value sense. And so how do we build on that? Yeah, yeah no, it's well said. And I think there is a, 
uh, a linkage uh, even to, to climate. If you think about, for example, the localization yeah. of supply chain for critical inputs for, for example, batteries, that is a... If I may, yeah, just please. to pick up, there absolutely is a link to climate, and there's a number of uh, uh, multinational CEOs uh, in the room and, uh, and uh, here this week. Um, and I, I can say from, if I put my Brookfield hat on for a moment, uh, the conversations with those companies, look, everybody's starting to fo focus on uh, aligning to the net zero transition as companies. One of the first things that companies look at is, well, what is their scope to emissions? Um, are they gonna take that responsibility in-house? As they relocate uh, elements of the value chain um, onto the shores of friends, I'm gonna keep with Janet's, uh, sure. Janet Yellen's analogy, um, onto the shores of friends, one of the first questions, okay, well, what's, where do my scope to, you know, where can I get zero emission power reliably at scale? And then security of supply, yep. uh, security of supply, critical minerals. And of course, last point in this room again, we'll know it well, Ivan's here. Um, critical supply of minerals for um, and metals for the net zero transition includes very mainstream uh, metals, copper um, uh, and uh, metal, you know, aluminum yep. and beyond, so. Yeah, no, no, spot on. Look, I, I wanna stay on the topic of climate. Uh, okay. You uh, coined the phrase, uh, you describe climate as a tragedy of the horizons. I want you to share uh, in a moment what that means, but I also want to call out um, that combined with the politicization of climate. And the U.S. Uh, is a prime example of, of that, uh, how that could manifest. So how do those two forces, in your mind, conspire to potentially arrest the progress toward a, a net zero world? Well, uh you know, the nature, so first, so we're on the same page defining tragedy of the horizon. I mean, the challenge is that um, the worst manifestations of climate, and we're already having some of the very difficult ones, but the worst ones, by the time they are uh, evident uh, in extreme uh, frequency of extreme weather and, you know, a billion people, I don't want to say it like that as an afterthought, a billion people living under lethal, lethal climatic conditions, uh, something in prospect on the current trajectory. By the time that happens, it's too late uh, to do anything about it. And, and the issue is that um, the actions that are taken, uh, the returns to those actions are beyond the normal horizons of of uh, politicians, CEOs, central bankers even, who have, uh, at least from a financial stability, longer horizon. So the question is, how do you bring the future towards the present, uh, and how do you forge that consensus? Now, it's interesting you say the sort of politi politicization of climate. Um, you know, it is a fundamentally political issue uh, because it touches all of us, not just in terms of um, the physical impacts, but the changes that are required in order uh, to address the issue. Some of them can be very positive, others uh, can be quite challenging. You need to forge, and Mona Forche is here, and, and, and Francois Philippe and others, you're forging that consensus uh, around the scale of, it, uh, of, of uh, steps we need to take, how to bring people along, and how to do it in a way that is integrated so that um, the jobs of tomorrow are being developed uh, at, uh, uh, you know, in a horizon that uh, people in the present can see. Yep. So it's, it, it's a huge challenge. Last point, if I may. Sure. A lot of what I've worked on as a central banker initially from a risk management perspective, and then subsequently with the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, the work for COP26 in the financial sector, has been to help bring the future to the present so that the financial sector is looking at a far enough horizon at a time that we all can do something about it. And then of course what has to happen, and it's very much in the spirit of these gatherings, is we get clarity, as much clarity as possible from governments about where are we going in 2030, 2035? No new internal combustion engine vehicles in 2035 in Canada. As, uh, as the minister knows and this room knows, that means that the financial sector starts to finance and business, more importantly, finance the type of supply chain uh, adjustments that are necessary in order to deliver electric vehicles uh, at scale and time and all the way back integrated into batteries and critical minerals. So you need the finance oriented that way to pull the future to the present, you need government to make clear what the future is and keep it simple as possible. Simplicity is our friend there. Um, and then of course you need, you need business and entrepreneurs to actually marry the two and provide the solutions yep. in between. No, look, you mentioned GFANS and uh, consensus and I don't mean to uh, 
uh, speak ill of some of my clients who are here. Uh, I, I love you all, but uh, investment organizations, uh, trying to get them to agree internally on something is a Herculean task. And, and what you accomplished yeah. with GFANS, where 140 trillion of AUM, so banks, asset managers, and asset owners, I think it was 130 in Glasgow, but we're now at 140, maybe even higher, uh, who collectively represent 140 trillion of AUM have committed to net zero, which, um, uh, you know, alone is a, is a pretty enormous uh, step in, in, in the right direction. But my question to you, uh, you know, in addition to obviously thanking you for that accomplishment uh, and your team, uh, is where next? Where does that capital need to flow to actually catalyze the transition? And where are the gaps that you're most concerned about? Well, uh, it needs to flow virtually everywhere, um, first point. Secondly, uh, because every sector, every company uh, will be affected by this. Um, secondly, it needs to flow to those companies with a plan to reduce their emissions. Um, uh, very importantly in that, it needs to flow to the hard, so-called hard to abate sectors. You know, the easy bit of this, and not, none of it's all easy, but um, some of the easy bit is, you know, rolling out uh, green energy at scale um, everywhere. And, and, and the only challenge in those regards, aside from permitting and things, is um, really thinking forward about the scale of system change and the additional um, uh, requirements uh, you know, in our grid. Our grid needs to not just be clean by 2035 in Canada. We probably need 50% more uh, capacity by that point. We'll probably need twice as much, certainly by 2040. And, and you know, again, uh, Quebec will be central to that, but everybody needs to be part. Anyways, I'm, I'm talking about the easy bit. You're asking me about where the gaps are and the hard bit. Um, we need a system that is focused on transition, um, <clears throat> a system that's going to get capital to uh, the steel producer, the, the transportation company uh, that has a plan and is investing at scale um, to get those emissions down, consistent with the pathway for their sector. Um, what we don't need is a system that everybody's incentivized to do portfolio decarbonization, yep. sell the stuff that's high emission, look good themselves, and you know our economy as a whole doesn't move. So if I can put a plug in, um, well, it's too late now. I'm going to. But uh, uh, GFANS put out uh, middle of June yes. uh, for consultation. You've seen it. Um, it's about 300 pages of what's a good transition plan for a financial institution across from banks to asset managers. What do we expect from the as the financial sector of companies? What are you trying to transition towards? And then how, very importantly, do we? phase out those assets that, for want of a better word, are going to be stranded. Um, that, um, but we're not going to flip the switch on them overnight, but how do you have the discipline around it? That's hugely important, that, that work, to get that right. If we have that, and we do have that $140 trillion, it's one of the only numbers that have gone up in finance over the last six months, unfortunately. Uh, is and we and and then we have effective government policy. We're really going to have a very powerful uh, machine, and we're we're seeing elements of that already. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, a lot of us were holding our breath um, post Glasgow in terms of absent the hard work you you and your team did in that six month period since um, the risk you 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 outlined of a green portfolio versus that was a, yeah. a real concern. And so I think the and and can I just be yeah. clear? So we're all the same page. What's going to come with that is going to be challenge to a bank or an, an investor or others who have uh, exposure to the steel sector, the aluminum, uh, the aluminum sector, the you know transportation sector, because their emissions could go up um, relative to dollar invested. But it, the question is, are, is it flowing to solutions? And if it's flowing to solutions, um, uh, and I'll make a, that's what we want. I'll make an imperfect analogy, but going back to the macro situation, look, it's a tough macro situation. We're on the cusp of uh, slowdowns and recessions in many uh, of our economies. Um, and there is going to be dislocation that comes with that. Um, Good investors, good entrepreneurs will s go into companies that they think have a prospect coming out of that, provide capital and move. And ultimately, you're judged by whether or not that company yeah. uh, delivers. Yeah. It's the same thing when you go to a high emission uh, yeah. company, whether they deliver on the decarbonization they promise. If they do, uh, we'll have absolute alignment, I think, of not just 
moving forward, but also uh, financial returns. Yeah. And that, I mean, what encourages me is you are seeing capital formation around that thesis, which is not just chasing the greenest, but chasing those uh, that aren't yet green, but have a credible pathway yeah. to getting to green. Um, another kind of area that, that we should touch on, uh, partly for my, my venture investing crowd that is with us, uh, climate tech. Uh, yeah. Which do you, are there specific technologies that you're most excited about? And just to kind of put that in context, you know, a few years ago, people thought direct air capture was science fiction, and now it's raising uh, real capital. Yeah. So is there one that's on the cusp of, of breakthrough that you're very excited about? Ooh, uh, well, I think, I mean, this is close to home here, but um, I, 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 like many others, I think have been impressed on how, uh, how much hydrogen has yeah. moved in over the course of the last, even 18 months, uh, the crossover time. It's not there yet, but you can see the pathway uh, by the end of this uh, decade. Uh, government, just to be clear, government still has an important role here, just as government did in off Sure, wind and solar and, and, and pulling this forward, but you can see the potential there. Um, you know, one of the issues for all of us to think about is uh, there's hydrogen and then there's uses of hydrogen and how well are we using that technology to get the broader benefits uh, from it uh, for economic development and others can speak better to that than me. I, I, so I, if, if you ask me to pick one, uh, I think the thing that makes me really excited um, Full disclosure, the thing that makes me terrified, if you will, or very concerned, is just how small the carbon budget actually is, just how tight a path the world is trying to uh, trying to walk on, and actually not walk on, run on, uh, to add the analogy. Uh, the thing that makes me excited is, you know, I, we could fill the, 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 the rest of our time talking about six to eight areas of technology, whether it's around distributed generation, ultimate integration, um, if whether it's around direct air capture and aspects of that, uh, whether it's around um, uh, nuclear and uh, SMR technology, which is moving fast, uh, even fusion, uh, you know, there, and, and part of the reason why this is happening, I think, I'll stop here, is that now what's mainstreamed is this conversation. Okay, we got to get to net zero, we understand that. Um, People are counting their emissions. It's becoming part of a value driver. There's a lot of capital available. And because it's 40% plus of the global financial system, it means it's not just infrastructure capital. It's not just loan capital. It's growth equity and it's venture capital. And last point, and you mentioned DAC, and I'll, I'll, I'll just, yeah, we talked about this earlier. Uh, you see venture slash quasi-philanthropic capital like Bill Gates, uh, Breakthrough Energy, and uh, Stripe um, uh, putting together this billion dollar uh, fund for with, with advanced commitments for a series of direct air capture technologies. That's, this is huge because it starts to bring those into the present. Yep, yep, and uh, the First Movers Coalition and, and others that, yep. yeah, that you know, you've been uh, engaged with. Um, just bringing it closer to home, um, uh, so finance it has announced some sum of money, I believe it's you know north of 10, uh, for blended finance type structures in Canada to support local climate investment. You also uh, have a global uh, sort of overview of the opportunity space given your uh, leadership yeah. role at Brookfield. Um, what are your hopes for that, for that uh, vehicle? Where do you hope to see it uh, be deployed? Uh, how do you hope to see it uh, structured so that it's really set up for success? Yeah, it's it, it, well. It's, it's a good question. I think the well. First off, let me say that one of the important things that I think paralleled that uh, announcement because that was in the last budget effect, yes. if I remember correctly, yes. um, was uh, the investment tax credit, um, uh, which um, has application for carbon capture, not direct air capture, as you know, but uh, effectively carbon capture. And having that as broad as possible um, is is a very important policy instrument uh, because I do think you know, for Canada as a whole, uh, we need to make a big bet in um, bet, I should say investment, Yeah, but it's a bet, um, <laughs> in uh, carbon capture, um, in uh, particularly in Western, in Western Canada, uh, uh, to address, you know, the 25% of our emissions that come from the oil and gas sector. Um, so necessary in and of itself, address that um, 
wouldn't say low-hanging fruit, but necessary to, uh, 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 to challenge right away. And then secondly, to give optionality on blue hydrogen, as you right. can appreciate another aspect. Yep. So the ITC, very important there. Um, I'm slightly farther away from budgets than I used to be when I was uh, in the Department of Finance. Um, so I'm less clear, Mona will, uh, Forche will know the answer to this, but the fungibility of that 10 billion in the IT, uh, investment tax credit. Um, but I do think that um, where it's best deployed uh, will be around um, elements of, let me, let me put it this way, which is the way I think about it, which is limited, but is there, there is a series of uh, investments that are necessary. A lot will be driven by the private sector, absolutely, in all these cases, um, in in and around um, carbon capture, the hydrogen development, you know, managing the existing uh, fossil fuel economy in Western Canada, and building that new uh, blue hydrogen economy, or, yep. or something around that. There is a series of investments in the core of our manufacturing base, um, uh, including but not limited to autos and all aspects of the auto chain, which is absolutely reinforced by what we talked about at the start, which is the reordering of the global economy, the rewiring of the global economy, opportunity for Canada to be front and center. Um, and there's a very clear message I think we would want to send the world, and I'll get to my third in a second, because it's, it's related to that, which is, look, this is a clean energy economy full stop. Mm -hmm. No brainer, clean energy economy, there's capacity. So as the world is being rewired, we've got clean energy, we've got amazing human capital, we've got you know, uh, uh, stability, we've got uh, fantastic uh, trading relationships uh, around the world, and all of that gets leveraged. Third uh, a big complex, I, th I think, is um, is is very much centered here uh, on on that second aspect, the the benefits of that uh, and building out, but also a high value hydrogen economy, high value hydrogen economy, and I think the subsequent panel probably can uh, speak to that in more uh, in in more detail what that potentially can mean. But so it's not just about producing it, but it's about upgrading and and deploying it. Yeah. No, it's a, it, it is, and I think it's the precipice of what could potentially be a pretty broad-based economic all-sector transition. Um, yeah. The transition word, though, I mean, your fund at Brookfield is, is called a transition fund. Yeah. So much of what we discussed uh, thus far is about transition. But I think you've made the point, and others have too, but you've made it quite eloquently that the climate has already changed. The world has already gotten hotter. Yeah. Um, and and the, the impacts of that reality are being experienced disproportionately uh, in, in, in some markets that maybe had the least to do with, with the contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. So on this topic of adaptation resilience, we're seeing a mm. meaningful gap in capital flowing, uh, something like an 8x gap, last estimates I saw. How do we get more capital flowing on ANR? What is the role of some of the multilateral institutions? What's the unlock, uh, your perspective? Yeah, look, yeah, it is, so all the numbers, um, or most of the numbers people throw around, including myself, uh, in terms of the scale of what's needed for climate transition, so the additional three and a half to five trillion uh, dollars a year, additional, mm -hmm. not just repurposing, uh, you know, two to three percentage points of global GDP incremental. Those are, as you know, are all about the energy transition itself. Yes. So it's mitigation, it's not adaptation and resilience. And you have orders of magnitude, similar orders of magnitude of ultimately what's going to be required, even if we, uh, even if we succeed, and obviously more if we don't. Um, look, and first uh, is to full up acknowledge that this is a massive gap and it's a huge issue um, uh, for human welfare globally. Secondly, um, there are some efforts that are being done on uh, the global insurance side, there's something called the Global Resilience Index, which should mature for um, uh, COP27, is something we're helping to catalyze, which is a much better mapping of um, extreme weather, extreme weather events, including to the very large parts of the world that suffer from a euphemism called the uh, prote protection gap. In other words, they're not insured. Um, and we do need globally first much better mapping of all that because then you have some prospect of some um, uh, portfolio insurance of that and some resources that can go there. But it is going to be a big role for the MDBs, uh, multilateral uh, development banks, uh, challenge and it does mean the way i think about it but but their resources are limited which means that we have to absolutely leverage the resources they have 
so that they are, I'm going to put it in the interest of time, a sort of an awkward way, but they, so they stay out of the way of the scaled private investment that can happen for mitigation um, so that the resources are more, uh, official resources are more devoted and domestic resources in these countries are more devoted to adaptation and resilience. Yep. Yep. Uh, we're running tight on time, Mark. Uh, I want to plug your book. Jenny did a great job. Um, the audio book, if you like Mark's voice, is narrated by, by yourself, which yeah. is uh, uh, quite, uh, quite the listen. Um, and, and look, the book is, the book is uh, brilliant. It was a, a gift to uh, the body of literature on this topic. Uh, it's been reviewed extensively. You've, you've, you've been on uh, multiple uh, interviews and panels. So I think your perspectives on the book, you've had plenty of fora to share. But what's really, what I'm really curious to know, and we promised to get into the real Mark Carney, okay. is um, that topic of, uh, of, of the erosion of values and the need to re-inculcate society with values. Uh, how has that affected your own personal career choices and decisions? How has that affected? Um, well, I think the first thing to say is that it's something I became more aware of over the course of the decisions I'd, I'd made. So when I went into um, uh, public life and certainly um, having worked through the financial crisis and some of the underlying causes of the financial crisis. Look, there were some basic blocking and tackling causes of the financial crisis, not enough capital, you know, uh, liquidity illusion in financial sectors, et cetera. But there also was, and you saw this not in Canada, where to the credit of uh, the, those in the Canadian system, a uh, private system, people came together and acted out of solidarity when they didn't have to. I mean, uh, there is probably, well, and this is a very knowledgeable group, but you know the asset-backed commercial paper crisis. I mean, you know, a lot of people actually it's it's a footnote that could have been an absolute disaster. Uh, it wasn't because um, you know uh, the institutions itself, led by the Caisse de Pau, uh, the levels of government, including uh, Jean Charest at uh, when he was uh, prime minister. Um, and others got together and, you know, it wasn't perfect, but worked it through. So there was a sense of solidarity. But globally, to get back to your question, and certainly I felt that when I went to the UK years afterwards, was the, the erosion of values within the financial system. The treating of financial transactions as, as almost a game that was being played on a screen, uh, not connecting what people were doing in high finance to ultimately somebody's mortgage, ultimately somebody's business, uh, somebody's job, and not you know, understanding that this was the, the, the purpose in the end, you're a few steps removed, uh, it's pretty shocking. And look, a, a number of the reforms were made were to reinstill some of that. Um, so, you know, aligning compensation incentives, having something called the senior managers regime in the, in, in the UK. Um, and I think they've had an effect, but in the end, you can't legislate virtue, you yeah. can't, you know, regulate it. Um, it, it. It is a cultural question. It does require companies and financial firms to have purpose, individuals to buy into that purpose uh, and to actually live those values. And then, and this is a lesson, uh, if, I, if I go back to what I was trying to draw out in the book, this is the other side of Adam Smith. Right, um, you know this well. You know we all think of myself included, Adam Smith, uh, wealth, uh, wealth of nations, uh, invisible hand. Mm -hmm. You know the power of the market, absolutely. But his core point uh, in all his work was everything is about an exchange, uh, exchange of meaning and language, exchanging of, of goods and markets, and exchange of values in how we view each other, what we value as a society, who we esteem in society. Those, that's what the moral sentiments are. And if you only esteem financial outcomes in yep. the short term, it ultimately undercuts some of those values that underpin the market. On the other hand, if you esteem sustainability, if you, uh, you know, Jeannie lives this uh, every day with the, with the mandate of uh, the uh, fund, um, then it, uh, can be contagious, if you will, or self-reinforcing in a positive way. And that's that's what we need to do. As well, society. I loved your tweet on, uh, you said, you can't understand the Smith Project, you really have to read the theory of moral sentiments and wealth and nations together yeah. and, not, and yeah. not one. I want to play a game. Um, 
Tyler okay. Cohen, uh, my favorite podcast host. You were on his show. He's good. Uh, yeah. He has a, it's a star-studded lineup. If anybody hasn't listened to Tyler Cohen, I encourage you to and start listen with to, uh, Mark. Uh, my advice is listen to Tyler Cohen. Don't go on Tyler Cohen's show. <laughs> yeah. So he's got this <laughs> game, really by the smart. way, which is called <laughs> Underrated and Overrated, where he throws uh, uh, t- terms, concepts, uh, topics at his, uh, at his guest. Uh, and uh, they have to say it's either underrated yeah. or overrated or, or fairly rated. He didn't play with you. No. And I felt badly for you, and so I want to rectify that. And so with <laughs> his relieved. permission, it was the only thing with that his went permission, right. yeah. okay. uh, if you will, sir, uh, are you ready to play? <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, uh, universal basic income. Ooh. Uh, underrated. Um, I was going to say the Montreal Canadiens, but I don't want to get you in trouble. Um, <laughs> Given where we are. Yeah, just so I'll say the Edmonton Oilers. Underrated, definitely. People sent no. uh, yeah, a bit yeah, of a, it's, it's I'm tempted to say mud, but I'm not going to. No, no. Uh, <laughs> um, quality of the argument uh, that was advanced in opposition of the Keystone Pipeline. Overrated. Okay. Overrated, yeah. Your friend, uh, I don't know if he's your friend, but I'm assuming all the economists hang out together. Uh, Thomas Pickett. <laughs> Thomas Pickety. Um, he is very high. He is very highly rated, and and so uh, Cohen's thing is all about the margin. So overrated, I'd say. Okay, <laughs> but because he's very highly rated, I, I'm not sure about the mapping of the analytic to the solution to okay. uh, the problem he identifies. Yeah, that's fair. Um, the final, and I only say this because I read that you've you, you're familiar with the work. Uh, the final uh, thirty six thirty six pages of the Ulysses. Well. <laughs> Wow. Um, uh, um, underrated. Underread. <laughs> Much discussed. It's like Adam Smith. Under- oh, you're under breath. Much discussed. Yeah, yeah. After underrated. page one. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Um, we'll do one more. Um, uh, algorithmic stable coins. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Even at current levels, overrated. Totally overrated. Okay. Never were going to work. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Appropriate. I think, answer. you know, I think the tougher question, if I may, is just stablecoin full stop and um, absolutely necessary to the way the crypto ecosystem is developed. Uh, to my way of thinking, um, when you have something that's so essential as a systemic node in the payment system uh, and over the course of decades you're running risks in terms of maturity mismatch and operational risks and other things why you wouldn't just staple that to the central bank balance sheet Mm -hmm. and have it as a cbdc as the link through the thing i don't i've never heard a good argument uh against that heard lots of hand wavy stuff around it that doesn't mean you don't end up having nfts or tokens or or and, and certainly that would all be consistent with DeFi as a probably will be organized. Yeah. Yeah. And we saw the, uh, I mean, we saw obviously the run on that and, and, uh, and the, the trust deficit that, that resulted in some. Well, let me, let me put it another way. Um, sometimes people talk about uh, taking stable coins and managing them as money market funds. Well, you know, in, in, in the time I was a central bank governor, 13 years, there were two meltdowns in the U S money market fund industry. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So we're going to have a meltdown in terms yep. of, yeah, it's like a meltdown in the, in the cellular yep. network. Like you can't, you know, you can't <laughs> yeah, yeah. have the, the core. Too soon, Mark. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, uh, since you're such a good sport and uh, uh, you love uh, being put on the spot, I'm, 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 I'm projecting, I'm assuming you do. Um, randomized control trials, they've taken over the field of economics. Uh, in fact, in 2019, Nobel <laughs> uh, Prize winners for economics have yep. done a, a great uh, body of work on uh, on uh, proving what drives, what can, what can alleviate property and, and disproving yep. uh, the impact of uh, uh, micro lending. If you could wave a wand and, and, and have an IRB approve any randomized control trial to test any economic question, and I recognize I'm putting you on the spot, uh, what question would you want tested? Wow, Vinay. Um, <laughs> okay, don't go on Tyler <laughs> Cohen. Uh, and don't get interviewed by a very capable management consult that's my those are my two life lessons um sorry i'll pull it up and don't lose your microphone i think that was deliberate to buy yourself some time it was a good move mark part of the act note that that's a really slick move it's all part of the act uh you know one of the things that i believe but don't know how you would execute we would execute is that we're going through we, we talked about the sustainable 
you know, the net zero transition. We haven't had time uh, and others could do it better than me, certainly, but talking about the digital transformation, uh, you know, the application of AI, machine learning, the rewiring and, and reworking of our economy through that. Um, and I do believe, and I talk a bit about this in the book, you know, this is, and it's an overused phrase, but it's the fourth industrial revolution. And what happened in the first three industrial, rev I'm working up to an answer, but the first three industrial revolutions is that eventually all our institutions change. Um, uh, you change uh, social welfare institutions, they start to emerge, uh, hence your UBI question. Um, you change your uh, labor market institutions. And in every case, we changed our educational institutions, the collective we. So first industrial revolution, you get universal primary education because you need a certain level of skill to work on the machines. Uh, second industrial revolution, universal secondary education. Uh, what we've seen in Canada and elsewhere with the third is we get up to 65, 70% tertiary uh, education. I think given the speed of the change that's coming, we need um, quadrenary uh, education. So in other words, mid-career training in at scale mm -hmm. um, and very, very broadly based. And so the randomized, and, and, and that needs to be integrated with the social welfare system because uh, hopefully people in their, when they're 35, 40, 45, somewhere in that zone, um, hopefully they have a partner, you know, a child, uh, a mortgage, um, and taking time out in order to do the year or so of retraining. Okay, blah, blah, blah. That's building up. So the randomized control trial I would do is around when, do, when are people likely to take that opportunity? Mm -hmm. What's necessary to take that opportunity? Right. Not just sort of spray money around, but understand, sure. uh, you know, we all, in our careers and things, there's moments where you're conservative, when you're, you take risks. Uh, what would nudge people and what would be the most effective way so that we could uh, reskill Canadians? Um, in, and, and I'll finish on this for that, which like to me, it's both a necessity, but it's a massive opportunity as well because, uh, Change is not as frightening if you're going to be equipped yep. for that change. And yep. you can take advantage of that change and you see the opportunity. And we can definitely do that. And let's not wait 30, 40 years of seeing a bunch of dislocation and saying, oh, I wish we had done that. Let's, yep. let's figure it out now. Yep. Mark, we owe you our thanks for having uh, devoted so much of your uh, professional life to issues that matter and that you care about. But this audience joining us today is, is uh, comprised of... Um, uh, people who care, uh, people who are in uh, privileged professional yeah. positions and uh, would love to hear from you. What is your call to action? What is your ask of this group uh, as we all go back to uh, uh, our, our, our day jobs? Yeah. Ooh. Uh, well, look, um, it's a, it's amazing. It is an amazing group. Um, I, the, uh, the thing I would ask, and it's a diverse group, uh, is I'm involved, I'm fortunate I'm involved in a few uh, uh, situations with companies uh, and individuals whose objective is to meet the Gates test, if you will. Bill Gates, when he wrote his book on how to solve a climate crisis, says, I'm not interested in any technology or any application that doesn't reduce uh, greenhouse gases by 2-3% of the total. If it's niche, it's just uh, the time's too short. And uh, so number of situations where people are looking to regenerate 1% of global agriculture or take out 1% of global carbon and think, you know, the big numbers. So I think the challenge and many people live it, is in your area where your passion is, what you care about, think about that percentage. What moves the needle in terms of whether it is um, uh, skills development, uh, whether it's uh, with, related, uh, you know, with respect to uh, sustainable development, wherever that is, what's your, 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 I'm, you're in the 1%. This room is in the 1%. Some of you really are in the one percent, uh, you know, financially. But you're in the one percent in terms of influence, uh, capability, privileged network, etc. So, what's the one or two percent of a major global problem, mm -hmm. Canadian problem, Quebec issue, that you're working to help solve, and then trace that back to how? I love it. Thank you, folks. Please join me in thanking Mr. Carney and Mr. Demaray. Uh Mark, it's my honor to thank you. And, uh, you know, as I was listening to you, I'm thinking there are not a lot of Mark Carneys in the world. Um, and one of the things we need in the world is what I call great thinkers with practical experience. And you're a great symbol of combining those two things. And we need more of that. And we need to expose you to more people. And we need more people to have the opportunity to listen to some of your wise counsel and, and practical points of view. 
I think uh, I'd like to comment on two, three things that you mentioned. One, some of the geopolitical. I think the geopolitical thing is bigger than what we've both, and we're getting older, <laughs> what we yeah. both lived in our generation. We've seen nothing like this uh, really since the Second World War. And I think that you make a very good point when, when you say people are, are doing resilience and, and being a capitalist myself. It's amazing how capitalists become frightened quite quickly and go to resilience. On the other hand, there's opportunity as well. In every bad situation, there's often an opportunity as well. So I think we have to encourage people to think about opportunity, as, you're, as I think as you're suggesting. But, but I think you can't blame people for being resilient and being careful uh, at this time either. And so you need to have, as you say, reliable countries, supply chains and such. And as you mentioned, Canada, we're very fortunate with Canada and the US, frankly, who is our neighbor as well to be placed here and have the opportunity to continue to develop um, with a less less risk. But I'm struck by your concept of transparency and really clear direction. And I think that if we need something today from our leaders, it's clear direction. And it's a sense because we can all plan. And you, it's much easier to be resilient uh, if you have an idea of what you're resilient against and where you're going and what, what to expect. And so I think we're gonna need more of that and and i was thinking to myself we've got to be careful not to have knee-jerk reactions and I'll, I'll give you an example in my mind i look at germany and i say okay germany um certainly went big with the climate change thing and they said so their nuclear is gone they said okay we're shutting it down where well, they shut down a ton of things they made a deal on the uh pipeline with the russians and suddenly this geopolitical thing happens and how times change and how moments change. And when you think of the position and the difficulty they're in now, where they may have to ration uh, 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 energy this, this winter, not only to people, but to enterprises. And that is the economic engine in Europe, certainly one of the big ones. And so you start to say, wow, look at what's happened there. And they're now one of the biggest importers, as you know, of uh, American coal. And so they have to refire up their coal plants, refiring, and I think we haven't seen the end of that. And yet there's still resistance to nuclear. So in my mind, we have to be very careful, I think, how quickly we go to things and how quickly we move from one to the other would be one point that I would make. Although I agree, this, this climate change is huge. It's mm. scary as hell. And with the economic and geopolitical challenges that we have, it's going to be even more difficult, I think, to stay focused on them. Uh, and, and therefore, you're going to need more people to support it and to keep pushing for it. Um, however, there's another point I'd like to make is I worry that in society, we, 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 we need to come together. And your asset back paper thing's a wonderful example. Mm. And, and, and I know because it's quite close to it, but I know how important a role you played. And there are two factors there that I think back that were clearly important. Coming together, and you helped a lot of Canadians in Quebec society came together as well. Many players here did to, uh, to um, stop the worst. And then the second one, though, is to be patient. You know, patience is important. If you look at those people today and you held on to your paper, you're going to be okay. Yeah. You're actually totally okay. Yeah. And yet we chastised raked a lot of the people that helped us through that over the coals. They, oh my God, they dropped the ball, they did this, they did that. But in fact, by staying steady and being courageous, they saw us through it, and today we didn't have a big explosion on our heads. Yep. Well, I think a little bit the same thing for energy companies, and I'm gonna surprise you here. Um, I worry that a lot of institutions and financial funds, of which we have many, are sort of saying, boycott the oil companies, boycott the energy companies, boycott the pipeline companies. I think it's a terrible mistake because I watch a lot of those companies. They're going to be supplying energy to us that we need and we're going to need in the transition. And a lot of those companies, frankly, are making huge steps to actually become greener and invest in green. And they have a lot of capital and they're putting out more capital for green solutions sometimes that many startups can put up because they have a lot of money and a lot of capital. So I think we have to be very careful, again, not to have knee-jerk reactions and say, okay, they're out, they're gonna be punished. 
and, and count people out. I think what's important is to make sure people are making an effort to get to where we need to get to and play their role commensurate with what their role can be. Because, um, you know, yeah. not all of us can play exactly the same role in that thing. So I just uh, want to thank you for being here. This conference is about discussion. It's about knowledge. It's about information. And you're a fantastic source of knowledge and information. We thank you for being here. And we all appreciate it tremendously. Right. Thank you.